If you want it all and you want it now, you're gonna need a summer house abroad because there are some cars that you can't get in America. The Porsche 959 is the grail of banned cars and the product of a unique set of circumstances. And Bill Gates' efforts to get his $1 million 959 into the US to find how the law treats banned cars. Money makes the rules. The World Rally Championship introduced a no-holds-barred category called Group B that produced insane cars like the Audi Sport Quattro S1. Turns out 500 horsepower cars that can hit a buck 25 in around 10 seconds rushing down forest roads was, uh, yeah, insanely dangerous. Who knew? It ended quickly. Had it gone on any longer, it would have gotten even crazier. Porsche and Ferrari were busy developing their own Group B rally cars. Porsche asked its engineers if they were allowed to do whatever they wanted with the 911. What would that look like? It would look like the 444 horsepower all-wheel drive twin turbo 959 that wasn't ready for Group B before Group B was ended for being too dangerous. So the 959 ran the grueling Paris Dakar rally and won. Automotive magazines of 1987 had nothing but praise for the machine that went beyond bench racing numbers. There was also lament, since Porsche was unwilling to sacrifice four examples for crash testing, and a new law regarding the import of cars not meant for the US market had just taken effect. This didn't deter Porsche fan Bill Gates, who bought one anyway, only to have it held in customs for 10 years. Finally, Gates and a Porsche importer from Santa Cruz, California, were able to get the show and display exemption passed that allowed cars of technological significance, with under 500 examples to be imported for limited use, less than 2,500 miles a year. This circumvented the crash safety rule, but the engine derived from the all-conquering Porsche 962 still couldn't pass smog so it had to be detuned. The 959 had a sticker price of $300,000 in 1987, but examples these days trade hands for one to two million bucks. Not all cool cars have cool sounding names. Meet the $230,000 Donkervoort D8 GTO Blister Berg Edition. I'm sorry, what? Donkervoort is a specialty manufacturer from the Netherlands, founded by Joop Donkervoort. They add humble beginnings, continuing production of Lotus's first commercial car, the Super 7. The Super 7 was the personification of Lotus founder Colm Chapman's design philosophy. Simplify and add lightness. It was a little more than a cost-worth engine and a chassis. Since then, companies like Donkervoort had added complexity to the formula. For Donkervoort, the end product is the monument to mechanical grip and horsepower to weight ratio, the D8 GTO. The D8 GTO is powered by a turbocharged 5-cylinder Audi engine, putting out 375 horsepower, enough to rocket the lightweight car to 60 from a standstill in under 3 seconds, and twice that in just over 8 seconds. Road & Track's road tester became convinced that Donkervoort translated to grab your Gouda because I'm gonna murder you in the face. The Blisterberg edition was created to set the track record at the Blisterberg racetrack for street legal cars at 1 minute, 46 seconds and 12 milliseconds. Well, street legal in the Netherlands and Germany. None of the 14 examples were available in the United States, owing to its lack of concern for safety, comfort, or emissions. Released in 2015, the initial asking price was around $230,000. Pagani might be considered patient zero for the modern boutique hypercar makers, with their first offering the $1 million Pagani Zonda. And that's just for starters. The Barchetta version of the Zonda held the record for most expensive car, with a price tag of $17.5 million, before Bugatti and Rolls-Royce said, hold my Dom Perignon. Pagani put an exotic wrapper around a well-tuned AMG V12 with Pagani's signature center cluster of exhaust pipes. For the Zonda, that results in a car that can make it to 100 miles per hour in seven and a half seconds. Whew. The Zonda was made with zero consideration for America's strict requirements, down to where the lights have to be. Subsequent Paganis tried to satisfy America's requirements but are still held up by safety issues. This didn't deter Wyclef Jean, who bought one under the show and display exemption. The first Aston Martin to wear the Lagonda was under a luxury sedan from a sports car manufacturer that had a distinct look, the very 70s impression of what the future might look like. Turns out, no, there's nothing like the Lagonda. Aston Martin had revived the Lagonda badge to go on a special edition of their $1 million Terraf sedan. Rather than the elegant driver's cars worthy of a super spy, the Lagonda Terraf is built for people who pay people to do the driving for them. But it's still an Aston Martin, so the chauffeur gets a 540 horsepower V12 under his foot that'll hurdle the giant beast to 195 miles per hour. The Lagonda Tariff is designed for an exclusive clientele, ones who can afford the car's $1 million price tag. 
It was designed for a market with lots of millionaires who are all in on the conspicuous consumption Dubai. Aston Martin figured that they'd find at least 200 takers, but in the end, only 120 were made. A total of one has made its way to California under the show and display exemption at Lamborghini of Newport Beach in 2019, but they wouldn't say where the low mileage example came from. Most modern hypercars are monuments to excess. While they boast big horsepower and other impressive states, there's also a focus on exotic materials and luxury touches that are more about exclusivity than they are usable performance. As a result, these cars are bought as investments, as most spend their days in air-conditioned garages. At roughly $300,000 price tag for a car assembled by 20 people in a small workshop in England, could easily be mistaken for one of these cars that's more bling than go, but that's not the Noble M600. Its 650 horsepower comes from Volvo and Yamaha. Its most exotic material is now standard carbon fiber. What it does bring is pure race car performance in a car that can wear license plates. As long as they aren't plates from the United States, Noble has made no effort to build the car to US specs. In the States, the TBR brand isn't that well known, mostly because the brand itself hasn't sold cars there for a few decades. When they did, they joined the ranks of AC and Sunbeam by having one of their lightweight sports cars become a host to a Mustang engine, resulting in the TBR Griffith. But since they left the States, they haven't slept. British enthusiasts have been treated to increasingly insane offerings, like the 400 horsepower Sagaris, noted for its wild driving nature. While it demands a relatively modest 100,000 pounds or so, the entire TBR brand remains elusive to American buyers. TBR flirted with a return to American markets by placing their flagship Tucson in the John Travolta computer heist film Swordfish, but the exotic sports car was not uh, what people remembered about that film. Lamborghini is arguably the parent of supercars in excess when they mounted their V12 sideways behind the driver in the gorgeous Muria. But it was the Countach that really set the stage. It also made the Countach a very hard act to follow. But the Diablo was up to the task, at least when it came to its 550 horsepower V12 and 4.5 second hustle to 60 from nothing. But the Diablo attained some of Countach's wild looks literally smoothing over the sharp edges. Porsche tuner Strosek decided what the Diablo really needed was a wilder look. So the headlights were changed and the side mirrors positioned higher on the car. These cosmetic changes were enough to get the 202 mile per hour beast banned from American shores for not conforming to safety standards. Diablos change hands for up to $400,000 today, but finding someone selling a Strosak is a trickier proposition. German Karl Benz invented the internal combustion engine for cars and since then, they've been doing their best to perfect it. One of these efforts is another boutique car maker Wiseman who are in the habit of taking already powerful BMW engines and wrap them up in attractive sports GT packages, with the king of the hill being the GT MF5. Sporting a V10 from the BMW M5, good for just over 500 horsepower, and the 0 to 60 dance in just under 4 seconds. Eww, that's fast. Founder Wiseman explored the notion of bringing his cars to the United States in 2010, but the expense of modifying the cars to meet US regulations proved too expensive. Then producing the cars at all became too expensive when the company went into solvency in 2014. The brand has been revived in recent years, with a new slate of cars including an electric-powered one. No word on if these new models under new owners will make the trip across the Atlantic. Jaguar has established a reputation for gorgeous luxury and sports cars, but not so much for luxury and sports cars that are terribly reliable. In the supercar wars that the 959 sparked in the late 80s and early 90s, Jaguar didn't want to be left out. They had partnered with Tom Wilkins in racing to create an IMSA GTP car that might be able to dethrone the then king of the Le Mans, the Porsche 962. As the GTP category began to get phased out, Jaguar took that partnership with TWR and focused it on a supercar capable of 220 miles per hour. Just to make sure everyone knew that was the case, they put it in the name, hearkening back to their iconic XK120 and XK150. With so many supercars vying for attention at the time and the McLaren F1 about to steal everyone's thunder, the XJ220 wasn't the success that Jaguar had hoped for. But collectors have started to come around to the combination of luxury and crazy speed, even if the 220 miles per hour claim was a bit dubious. Jaguar still produced a competition model, the XJ220C, and to meet production requirements, they made a street-legal version, producing 690 horsepower, called the XJ220S. 
This was enough to earn the distinction of the fastest production car in the world with a top speed clock at 217 miles per hour. Only six were made with one making it to US shores under the show and display exemption. The regular model had a cameo as one of the cars Memphis's crew had to steal in Gone in 60 Seconds under the codename Bernadine. The Porsche 959 might be the white whale of the banned cars in the US for collectors of exotic European fare, but for those who like their cars with more of a JDM or Japanese domestic market flavor, nothing tops the Nissan Skyline R34 GTR V spec. Skylines are legends in the GDM crowd, considered by some the best Japan has to offer, as long as you're in Japan. Until recently, the all-wheel drive beast of a car nicknamed Godzilla was never spec for the US market. They couldn't meet smog or safety standards, and Nissan didn't have enough faith that Americans would buy a six-figure Nissan as a hyper-performance car. So Skyline fans had to rely on show and display exemptions and waiting for the 25-year rule to allow the R34 to be imported to the US. One of the R34's biggest fans was Fast and Furious actor Paul Walker, who had one of his own. That car has changed hands a few times since then, but is estimated to be worth around $400,000. In 2024, the 25-year rule kicks in, and well-heeled import tuner fans will be able to begin the process of federalizing the R34. Before there was Ferrari, there was Alfa Romeo. In fact, Enzo Ferrari started his racing obsession with Alfa Romeo before founding his own company. Clarkson, May and Hammond of Top Gear and the Grand Tour figure that everyone should own an Alfa Romeo at least once. Now under the Fiat and Ferrari banner, Alfa Romeo has been returning to prominence, offering a sports sedan and SUV in the US, as well as the compact mid-engine two-seater, the 4C. The 4C is the little brother of the 8C, with the Ferrari-sourced 440 horsepower V8. Introduced in 2010, it was meant for the US market, but getting the 8C Spider to pass US regulations proved not worth the hassle for the low-volume car. The $400,000 exotic did make an appearance as Matt LeBlanc's car in the series episodes. British sports car manufacturer Morgan has taken the adage, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, to new heights. Up until last year, their roadsters were built on the same chassis as they were dating back to the middle of last century. The car on top of that chassis hasn't changed much either, looking for all the world like a car that was made in the 30s. This reluctance to change has kept the 4-4 Roadster from meeting modern safety standards, like its total lack of airbags. Morgan does have some more modern offerings, like the Aero 8, that can be sold in the US, the traditional model cannot, though Morgan has come up with a rather unique workaround. Rather than updating their updated verse model, they started selling them with some assembly required. As a kit car, they fall under special construction rules, which are more lax than those for production cars. Ooh, sneaky. There are two different Land Rovers, quite literally, actually. The first Land Rover is the go-anywhere off-road British answer to the Jeep that fought World War II and became the flagship for African safaris. The brand changed hands forever and formed a new identity, including inventing the luxury SUV market with the Range Rover. Land Rover and Range Rover have been selling those luxury SUVs in the States since the 80s. Land Rover never forgot its go-anywhere rugged series roots, though. That torch was carried by the Land Rover Discovery, and extension of the original Land Rover. Go anywhere, except the United States, that is. From 1993 to 1997, the Defender was perfectly legal in the US, but changes in regulations became too much for the slab-sided adventurer, taking the car from the US until this year when a newly compliant Defender once again can be sold in the US. Folks trying to get around the ban were disappointed when Customs seized and crushed 40 examples that were illegally imported. With the scarce Defenders demanding $100,000 in some cases, it must have been hard to watch. Renault had less than spectacular relationship with the American car buyer, last seen on the shores selling the quirky and odd Renault Le Car. What American buyers didn't get to see is Renault's crazy side like when they took the Le Car, the R5 in France, and put a turbocharged engine in the middle where the rear seat used to be to create the R5 Turbo that held up Renault's racing efforts in the 80s. The R5 Le Car gave way to Renault's next compact economy car, the Clio. While the Clio might not be anything to write home about, Renault remembered its crazy gene and went to Tom Wilkinshaw Racing, the people from the Jaguar Supercar, and put a 247 horsepower V6 where the rear seat used to be for the Clio now driving the rear wheels. The V6 Clio Sport never made it to the US for a relatively boring reason. Renault does not sell any car in the US. 
Exactly one did manage to make its way to the States with the more lenient Florida registration, imported in 2010 and going on sale again in 2017 for around $70,000. Fans of Top Gear with Clarkson, May, and Hammond might remember their obsession with the Toyota Hilux, namely their theory that it is the world's most unkillable vehicle. The trio subjected their example to increasingly brutal attempts to end their truck, only for it to stubbornly start no matter what they threw at it. With that kind of endorsement, you'd think that the Hilux would be Toyota's flag ship pickup. And it is. Everywhere except the United States. This time by design, at least on the US's part, via something called the chicken tax. A 25% tariff on various goods, including like trucks. The Tacoma and Tundra get around this by being built in the US. Subaru got around it by putting jump seats in their Brat to sell it as a passenger car. Thanks to their indestructible nature, free chicken tax models are probably still running somewhere. The biggest problem with gray market imports from Japan and the UK is the steering wheel is on the wrong side. In order to pass on two-lane roads, you have to peek out and then see if your passenger is terrified to know if the coast is clear.